today on Straight Talk Africa, presidential term limits, and the politics of succession in Africa. The quest for another term cost Burkina Faso's Blaise Campayore his presidency and has triggered a political crisis in Burundi. Critics say some of today's African rulers believe they alone have the vision thing to guide their nations to the promised land. That's coming up next right here on Straight Talk Africa. Hello, welcome to Straight Talk Africa, live from the Voice of America studios here in Washington. It's Wednesday, June 24th. I am Shaka Sali. Well, hello to you, Shaka, and hello to all our viewers and listeners on the continent and elsewhere. I'm Mariama Diallo, your social media reporter. Today, we'll talk about term limits and the politics of succession in Africa. And coming up later in our STA inbox, we'll share your thoughts on the topic through your emails, tweets, and Facebook comments. Hope you'll stay with us. But first, according to recent major public opinion surveys, the vast majority of African people support presidential term limits. But many leaders on the continent do not respect the concerns of their citizens or see the far-reaching political consequences of imposing themselves on their people. My colleague, Paul Sisko, has more. The constitutions of many African countries mandate limits of two presidential terms, usually of four or five years in length. The presidents of Algeria, Chad, Sudan, Gambia, Uganda, Congo Brazzaville, and Eritrea have all served for more than 15 years. The leaders of Angola, Cameroon, and Zimbabwe have all ruled for over 30 years. Africa's longest serving president, Teodoro Obiang of Equatorial Guinea, will mark 36 years at the helm of that country in August. Zimbabwean President Robert Mugabe, speaking recently to the African Union in Johannesburg, says the two-term limit is too restrictive. We put a yoke on our, around our necks. We say uh, each leader, leaders must have only two terms. In Europe they haven't said that. In America, because they are vast, it's a vast country. Yes, that's where they have two terms. But in Europe, no. It's democracy. If the people still want a leader, let the leader continue. But when we have served two terms, ah, we have not done much. And two terms was like two weeks. <laughs> so we want to go more. So you want another, another term and you must find an excuse. Burundian President Pierre Nkurunziza's persistent interest in running for a third term has brought violence to his streets and worldwide condemnation. Challenging constitutional term limits forced Burkina Faso's President Blase Compayari from office in October 2014. Earlier this year, efforts to formally limit leaders of the economic community of West African states to two terms failed, in part because the long-standing presidents of Togo and the Gambia opposed the measure. Opposition groups in the Democratic Republic of Congo fear that President Joseph Kabila may be leaning towards seeking an unconstitutional third term in elections scheduled for 2016. Rwanda's President Paul Kagame is also refusing to rule out a run for another term when his mandate expires in 2017. And Uganda's President Yoweri Museveni has been in power since 1986. He had the Ugandan parliament dispose of term limits a decade ago. The 70-year-old leader is now poised to run for a fifth term in February 2016. Paul Sisko, VOA News. Thanks, Paul, for that interesting report. Uh, now joining us here in our Washington studios are two distinguished guests. Amama Mbawazi is a former Ugandan prime minister who recently declared his intention to seek the Ugandan presidency under the ruling National Resistance Movement or the NRM. Well, I have to say frankly that uh, I am profoundly honored 
and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host you on Straight Talk Africa for the first time, by the way. Thank you very much, uh, my brother Shaka. It's my great pleasure and honor to be here today. You must, you're most welcome, sir. Thank you. And Ambassador Herman J. Cohen, former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs from 1989 to 1993, is currently the president and co-founder of Cohen and Woods International, a consulting firm that assists U.S. business in Africa. He recently authored a book entitled The Mind of the African Strong Man, Conversations with Dictators, Statesmen, and Further Figures. Well, Ambassador Cohen, you're most welcome, of course, sir, once again on Straight Talk Africa. Pleasure to be here. It's always a pleasure, of course, sir, hosting you. And by the way, congratulations for this important masterpiece of a book. Thank you very much. You're most welcome, sir. Later in the program, we'll give you, the audience, a chance to call and talk with our guests. The number to call is 202-619-3111. The U.S. country code is 1. Well, let me come to you uh, uh, immediately, Amama Mbwazi. I have to tell you, frankly, that uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, this program is rather historic mm. in the sense that um, if you walk back in memory lane, I remember meeting uh, a very young man uh, in Higgins High School Primary, Kavari, southwestern Uganda. Yes. Do you remember the same? Yeah, I do. <laughs> and then, of course, later, Kigez High School, Kigez College, Butovere. And then, at one time, on a bus ride yes. from Kampala to Rukunjiri. That's correct. And now we are right here on another bus ride <laughs> in Washington, D.C., of all places. Yes. How does it feel for you? Well, it's been a long ride, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to congratulate you, particularly my brother, on your achievements. Because uh, it's true we were at school together, and then Shaka abandoned school. He went to the army. The military. To the military. Became a paratrooper. Yes, he became mm -hmm. a paratrooper. And that bus ride <laughs> was very important because we discussed his future. Correct. Whether it lay in the military <clears throat> or elsewhere. And I was very delighted that he took up the advice, went to school, and he's a distinguished African and world figure. Congratulations. Well, I have to say that I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled for your compliments and support. You're welcome. And I have to say, as far as you're concerned, me too. And as far as your success is concerned, the feeling is mutual. Thank you. Now let's go to the business on hand. Uh, we're talking about uh, term limits. Mm. There is a survey, of course, as you have seen, uh, uh, which f frankly um, suggests that uh, a vast majority of the African people support term limits. And a particular reason why a lot of African leaders are not on the same page with most of their people. Well, as you may know, my brother Shaka, I have been I would say, one of the chief proponents of no term limits. And um, the reasons were strong, and I think they still remain strong. Mm -hmm. And in summary, the reasons are that um, Africa, the history of Africa, is replete with failure. Mm -hmm. If you look at slave trade, our people, stayed in slavery for 300 years. What did the African leaders do to stop it? Mm -hmm. They didn't stop it. Instead, they participated in it because they hunted their subjects and sold them into slavery. Mm -hmm. Poor leadership. Eventually, we were colonized directly. Why didn't we successfully resist colonization? Mm -hmm. Poor leadership, with the exception of Ethiopia. Even after independence, you know our history, Idi Amin in Uganda and other, I don't want to mention other leaders mm -hmm. for, for obvious reasons, but Uganda is a good example, um, poor leaders. So the argument that when you get good leaders, you should not uh, you know, just get rid of them 
like that mm -hmm. uh, is not a weak argument in the context of that history. However, of course, on the other hand, normally these leaders who become strong come from a background of uh, almost oblivion. They are not known until they come up and they become great leaders. So if you came out of nowhere and you became a great leader, mm -hmm. why on earth would you imagine that someone else will not come in similar circumstances and be a great leader? That's a very important question. That's very interesting. Uh, I, I personally don't think that uh, I have a problem, frankly, uh, in as far as time limits is concerned, uh, because there are some examples uh, of leaders who have been very exceptionally unique. I mean, you can talk about Lee Kuan Yew and his Singapore. The man was in power for 31 years, and he was able to develop his country, which was really backwater, third world, mm -hmm. until it became a first world. But these are very unique individuals, and in fact, he was not a president. He was a prime minister operating under a system of parliamentary systems. Yes. Parliamentary democracy suggests that uh, the party that wins or a coalition uh, uh, or uh, an alliance of parties that form a government mm. can actually appoint a leader. But when it comes to a president, really, and especially when we come to our country, Uganda, uh, where I remember when I was a graduate student at UCLA in California, I was a Ford Foundation fellow doing research in Tanzania, in Dar es Salaam, when uh, a young man by the name uh, President Yoweri Museveni was sworn in power on January 29, 1986. Mm -hmm. I was one of those many people who were so happy, so inspired, especially by what he said. Mm -hmm. He said that the problems of Africa is not about the African people, really. It is rather about African leaders who overstay in power. In fact, we were still longer than 10 years. And yet, the last time I checked, Mr. President Museveni is in his 29th year and he still wants to run for office next year. How do you react to that? Is it because he's a particularly unique individual, as you have suggested in the past? Well, um, I am actually not sure that... Um, talking about President Museveni makes the point because uh, the point is strong on its own. Mm -hmm. um, when you have achieved success as a leader, mm -hmm. you see, the tendency is to believe in your own success. And I think some of our leaders and I'm not necessarily referring to President Museveni. I actually don't like referring to individual leaders because it's not the leader, the individual that matters. Mm -hmm. It's the idea, the principle. And that's what I would like to address. Right. If um, someone remains in power, this happened in Britain, even where you don't have time limits, in the case of Margaret Thatcher, or even Tony Blair for that matter. Ten plus years. Yes, where they stayed for a long period in power and you could see by their conduct, by the way they took decisions, by the way they related to their colleagues, that that success had entered their mind and influenced their actions. And sometimes this has a tendency of making leadership derailed from the original principles. Mm -hmm. This is a fact, a fact I see. of life. I see. Well, now we'll pause for a short break and would like to remind you that Straight Talk Africa is now on the social networking website, Twitter. And we are tweeting live. Follow us at VOA Shaka. That's VOA Shaka. And join in on today's discussion with your questions and comments. Don't forget to use the hashtag VOA Third Term or VOA Term Limits. And we are still on Facebook. Just enter the keyword Straight Talk Africa. Become a fan and connect with the other friends of the Voice of America. We'll be right back with you, so please, don't go away. Let's take a look at presidential term limits in some parts of Africa. 
We'll start in Burundi, where in 2014, the country's president, Pierre Nkurunziza, failed to get enough votes in parliament to revise the term limit restrictions in the constitution. But the nation's constitutional court ruled in May that he's allowed to run for a third term in July. Rwanda's president, Paul Kagame, is poised to run for a third term in 2017. That's amid rumors that 11.6 million people were forced to sign a petition urging parliament to change the presidential term limit clause in the constitution. In Togo, despite strong opposition, the country's president, Fort Nyasimbe, has refused to implement political reforms leading to a presidential term limit. He was re-elected to a third term in April. I wanted to present music and a side of American culture that is most important to me, that is a part of who I am. They're going to get some incredible performances. That's one of the things I love, bringing these artists in so you can get to see them do what they do. It's soul music, and that's what music is. It's that which comes from the soul. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. What is your opinion about today's topic? Call us at 202-619-3111. U.S. country code 1. When you call, remember the following. Ask only one question. Keep your comment brief and turn down the volume on your radio or television. Now let's return to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Esther Gidiu Ewart, and this is Straight Talk Africa. Coming to you live from Washington. Let me come to you, uh, Ambassador Cohen. Of course, uh, you listen to your fellow panelists. Uh, to what extent uh, do you agree with his uh, analysis here, especially when you compare and contrast the presidential system with parliamentary system, where you have a prime minister who doesn't run really for national office, but it's a party that does that, and uh, the party eventually appoints the person to become a prime minister. Moreover, when you compare some of these advanced Western nations, you're talking about societies, really, where people are highly educated, uh, socially and politically aware, to such a, a degree that uh, if they get tired of the person, for example, in number 10 Downing Street, they will definitely vote him out. You know why? Because even their elections are elections. They're not selections. They reflect the will of the people. That, that's right, and I think uh, in Europe you have very strong party systems. So look at Margaret Thatcher. She was prime minister. She was there a fairly long time. But when the people started getting tired of her, her own party exactly. voted her out. Exactly. And look at South Africa. When uh, yes. President Mbeki started to falter, his own party voted him out. So a strong party system, it seems to me, is just as important as constitutional uh, elements. But you mentioned earlier that the African people want term limits, according to polls. Correct. Well, I studied some of the constitutions before coming here, and I looked at the Rwanda Constitution, and it says, under no circumstances mm -hmm. can a president serve <laughs> more than two terms. Now, that's very strong language. And the Constitution also says, this, the Constitution may not be revised to change the terms of a president. And it's the same thing in the Congo Brazzaville and Congo Kinshasa. This constitution cannot be revised to change the term. And what, what bothers us in the United States is not so much how many terms people have, but when the head of state tries to change the constitution for his own benefit. Yes. In our country, we've changed the constitution 25 times. And when we changed it for term limits, it did not impact on the current president, who was then Harry Truman. Mm -hmm. It only was impacted on the following president, you see. So we, we, that's why we're encouraging Africans to have two terms, because it's good for democracy in general. It's very interesting that uh, you mentioned the Rwandan scenario. I'm sure you are not aware of the process underway right. in the capital of Chigari. Right. Uh, you had uh, uh, 3.5 million signatures. Uh, which have petitioned the Rwandan parliament, uh, the RPF party, to change that same constitution. 
Uh, what about the fact that uh, when the president goes into office, he swears to defend, protect, and preserve that most important document? Why can't the international community come out and take a position like they have taken on military coups right. and say that uh, if you are a president elected by the people, rightly or wrongly, under no circumstances, can you change that constitution to, in a sense, uh, reflect your personal or political interest? If you do that, it becomes a moral equivalent of a military coup. You're absolutely right, and I think Rwanda is a special case because of the genocidal history. But you're going to see this happen in Congo, Kinshasa. If President Kabila manipulates things so that he can stay beyond the term limit, the international community is going to react very, very strongly. I can, I can guarantee you that. They are talking about Congo, Kinshasa. They are basically pretty much uh, focusing on uh, Pierre Nkurunziza uh, in Bujumbura like a laser beam, but they are very silent, for example, on people like Sasun Gueso. Nobody talks about uh, the president of Equatorial Guinea, Theodore Obiang. Nobody talks about uh, a lot of other presidents, frankly, Paul Bia of Cameroon and what have you. Why have these double standards? That's a very good point, but I think the international community, when they look at a continent like Africa, they focus on unstable countries where people are suffering, mainly. And Congo, Kinshasa is probably one of the worst, I think, right now. So they are going to be very strong in trying to prevent Kabila from continuing in office. Very interesting. Uh, let me come to you again, uh, Amam Mbawazi. You are a freedom fighter. You supported uh, a group who, under very difficult circumstances, in fact, a party that was equally supported by my own father, John Wilson Mushakamba, now the late. Uh, I remember him telling me, frankly, that uh, he admired Uganda and the President Yoweri Museveni because, in his words, he felt that uh, he was perhaps uh, the best thing that ever happened to Uganda since sliced bread. And I say, what do you mean? He said, because he believes in social justice. But if he were alive today, do you sincerely think that he would still be feeling the same way? Well, <laughs> you know very well how close I was to your father. Yes. And your father was um, particularly uh, great leader in as far as we, the young people at the time, were concerned because he was of the older generation, mm -hmm. but he quickly picked up our message right. of the young people. Right. And he embraced it and actually we formed the party and he became part of it. Correct. Prior to that, he had been supportive of uh, our armed struggle. Um, James Karamzi, who was executed together with others. Publicly executed Publicly, in 1973 yes, in Kabale Stadium. Yes, publicly executed. Having been found by Armenian soldiers with weapons allegedly belonging to rebel leader Yoweri Museven of that's, Rodasa. That's correct. And it's true that these were our colleagues, our comrades in combat. Now, these were exceptional people, certainly. And they could see far, mm. far ahead of people of their generation. And um, I think most probably if he was alive, he would still subscribe, as I do, to the core principles of our war, our revolutionary war, mm -hmm. to the core principles of the NRM, which was the successor of the various um, organizations we established to, to struggle. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know whether he would uh, have the same mind as I do now mm -hmm. that um, the president, uh, of course, has done a great job. He led us very well in mm -hmm. war. Mm -hmm. He has led us very well in the peace. And we have achieved a great deal in Uganda. Mm -hmm. Uganda has really been a success story. Mm -hmm. But if I can talk about that, my position 
very clearly, which I've discussed with the president, I've written to him and told him so, is that there comes a time for change. We've done a lot of things. We've reached a level which is acknowledged by the whole world as a level that had actually not been expected of Uganda mm. uh, a long time ago. But now is the time to move a notch higher. We have been in leadership for nearly 30 years now. And it is inevitable that there will be a generational transition mm -hmm. in terms of leadership. And my offer to our people is to lead that transition of leadership from our generation to the next. And I can talk about it when you give me the opportunity later on. If the president, uh, just suppose the Ugandan president was in fact watching this show, yes. um, what would you say to him? You could look in that camera, for example, and directly address yourself to him. Well, as I said, really, I don't think it's, it helps to talk about individuals, and uh, I, I was not particularly talking about this. You know, I've had a great relationship oh, yeah. with the, the president. There's no question about it. Yes. You are great buddies, but let's face it, and, you are challenging him. And you have offered to challenge him, him, to challenge him, and frankly, from everything I have seen, he doesn't seem to be comfortable with the possibility of being challenged by a former comrade of his, a great friend of his. I actually don't think I'm a former comrade. I think I'm still a comrade. Our friendship has endured all these wars, exile, peace, government. And I think that strong relationship still endures. What about, I have no uh, doubt about it. What about Colonel but, Dr. Chiza Besije, mm -hmm. also your comrade, really? Yes. He went to the bush with you. Mm -hmm. He worked very closely with you and the president. And yet, when you look at the manner in which your government, your movement, your party in power has treated him in the past, you begin to wonder what you guys were fighting for. Did you, in fact, go to the bush, as you said, to fight to restore democracy, as it were? Mm -hmm. But I can come to that, but I wanted to answer the question you asked earlier. Mm -hmm. If the, I was talking to the president, I have talked to him. Uh, what would I tell him? You know, some of my colleagues have told me directly that they think the position I have taken is uh, not proper, that um, um, it is... Uh, Divisive? It is... Um, um, almost treacherous. You know, I don't agree. Absolutely. You see, a friend is not one who tells the other, his friend, what that other person wants to hear. Mm. Rather, the one who tells him what he ought to hear, what he needs to learn and hear. And that's my role. That's my total friendship with my elder brother, who has been my leader all this time. Your big brother. Unfortunately, time happens not to be our best ally. We have to go for a break. And when we come back, I'll give you an opportunity to complete your thought. You're tuned in to Straight Talk Africa. We'll have more of a discussion in a moment. But first, here is Maria Majaro. Take it away, Maria. Well, thanks, Shaq. And still to come, we'll reveal some of the fantastic and quite passionate feedback we've received from our audience through social media. But now, here is our letter of the week. Jacob Katumusumi in Kampala, Uganda, writes, It's quite absurd how Africans claim democracy with leaders who have turned into supreme national leaders. The leaders have turned their constitutions into ceremonial documents. Africa is doomed to shading its historical map with darkness if we don't go back to the drawing board. Like Voice of America on Facebook. Follow VOA on Twitter. 
Twitter. Join VOA on our YouTube channel. Like, follow, join VOA. This is Straight Talk Africa on the Voice of America. Call us now with your questions and comments. The number is 202-619-3111 and the U.S. country code is 1. Call us direct and we'll call you right back. Remember to turn down the volume on your radio or television and keep your comments brief. Now back to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Esther Gidiu Iwat, and welcome back to Straight Talk Africa, live from Washington. Once again, it's time to bring in my colleague and social media reporter, Mariama. Take it away again, Mariama. Well, thanks, Shaka. Many African political observers say that term limits are crucial because it levels the electoral playing field. Must incumbents have an advantage over opposition candidates because they often have access to more campaign money and resources. So without term limits, it's difficult for an opposition candidate to get elected. This is mostly true on the continent where the winner of an election is, prim is primarily determined by who has greater funding over who has the best policies. Well, this leads us to our question of the week asking, how do you feel about African countries amending their constitutions so their leaders can avoid term limit restrictions? Well, you had a lot to say, and sorry we couldn't read them all, but here are a few that we'd like to share, beginning with a comment from Bright Boasiaco from Ghana, who writes, I don't think a term limit is the cause of Africa's problem. What nations need are good policies that have nothing to do with politics and are accepted and respected by all. It shouldn't matter much who takes the wheel. Well, another reminder that we are tweeting live today. Just use the hashtag VOA term limit or VOA term limit. And speaking of it, let's go to a tweet from Christopher Simon of Tanzania who writes, Good laws or amendment of laws is not enough. What is needed is committed leaders with a sense of love to their people. We have another tweet from Paul T, or he calls him, himself a skeptical Paul, interesting nickname, of a Shropshire in the United Kingdom who tweets that it's, it's essential that they are restricted to, term, to terms only. Some leaders are halting progress and should step down now. Well, Shaka, some of these comments are pretty short and concise and right on point. Please give us your take. Very interesting. Uh, how do you react to that, uh, Ambassador Cohen? Well, uh, I, I don't think we should be obsessed with term limits or yes or no. I, I agree with the person from Ghana who, who wrote that what we need is good government, not, not term limits. That would, and you could have someone who leaves office and had bad governance or some who have good. So I, I think what counts are leaders who are committed to do very good things for the people. When they wake up in the morning, what do they think? How do I expand my power? How do I make more money for my family? Or how am I going to help my people today? That's the type of leader I like. Very interesting. Mariama, do you have any more feedback to share with our audience, please? Oh, yes, we have plenty. Let's go to a posting from Jacob uh, Nanthupi uh, from Cambridge, once again uh, from the UK, who writes, Action speaks louder than words. The Burundian President Pierre Nkurunziza could have accepted the people's voice when they protested. They gave him a clear sign that they no longer wanted him in the driver's seat. But our leaders are too greedy for power. The power to govern is delivered by the people. Leaders should not try to cling on to power as their mandates to rule nears an end. I cry for my beloved Africa. Well, I cry too sometimes. Well, let's check out uh, one more post uh, this time from Facebook. It comes from Mohamed Kujabi of uh, Brikama in Gambia. Well, I know exactly where that place is as I lived in Gambia for a while and in Serekunda. In particular, I'm going to take a moment and say hello to everyone who's watching. 
or listening to us there. Anyway, Gujabi writes, I think a referendum should be held for the citizen to decide whether a term limit amendment should be changed or not. The decision to amend should not be made by the parliament because if the ruling party has a majority in parliament, there is high tendency that it will support an amendment. If the citizens favor an amendment through a referendum, then so be it. Shaka, speaking of Gambia, the current leader, Yaya Jame, has been there for a while, basically, since he took, uh, he took over from former president, uh, Dauda Kairaba Jawara. Your thoughts on Interesting. this Interesting. Uh, I want my reaction, please. Well, <laughs> I think that, um, uh, you know, one other reason we had, which in a way is made by the point you made about Rwanda. Um, the question of choice, because the whole concept of democracy is freedom to choose. Mm. Um, and in the arguments we've had in supporting no term limits, we, we've argued that it limits that freedom. But in reality, when you look at what is happening in some places, then you begin to wonder whether there is real choice, that freedom, or one is talking of a mirage, an illusion. Yes, a facade. A facade. Because if the state machinery is used to suppress competition, State machinery is used in circumstances like ours, mm -hmm. where populations are poor, or where even the level of awareness of their rights is not very advanced. Then clearly you can see that choice in this case is a mirage. So term limits help because they actually give people that choice as well, because uh, you have a level, as someone was saying, a level ground in terms of competition. Level and playing field. A level playing field. And I think that is good for democracy, that's good for our people. Do you have that in Uganda, for example? Well, we don't have term limits. Uh, no, you obviously took care of that in 2005. Yeah. But right now, when if somebody were to ask you, mm. and you were to talk to him or her, from the deepest, better part of your Kanungu heart and soul, yeah. do you sincerely have a situation in place where the space is open for anybody that is willing to run for any office, including the highest office in the land, without running into a lot of obstacles? Because I have seen a lot of pressure brought upon Amama Mbabazi, who was, until recently, a powerful Secretary General of the ruling NRIM, a Prime Minister of Uganda. In fact, sometimes referred to, even before he became Prime Minister, as a Super Minister. And yet, for everything I have seen, it looks like, frankly, uh, yeah, there is a problem on the ground. Yeah, that, that's true, because, uh, you know, since I made declaration about my aspiration to be a candidate for president, a lot of things have happened. Uh, up to 100 of my supporters have been arrested by the police. And the crime they have committed is to dare say we support Amam and Babazi, or to have possession of uh, things like posters, like T-shirts with my picture. That is the crime they have committed. I did discuss this with the president, and the president told me he would instruct the police to stop it. It has not stopped. Uh, I left after that. It continues even today as we speak. But I hope we can sit down and sort out this. My appeal to our people in Uganda and to the whole of Africa is 
we should introduce a certain level of decency in politics. We should have clear rules which affect everyone, which we all observe, and there should be equal opportunity. Nobody should take advantage of anything of others. That's the critical question. In my case, I do believe that um, I have support, of course, in the population. I am acting strictly in accordance with the law. I did write to our electoral commission and I wrote to the police as well to inform them that I'll be making a tour of the country to promote my aspiration. Our laws require that to be a presidential candidate, to be nominated as a presidential candidate, you must have at least 100 registered voters sponsoring you from at least two-thirds of all the constituencies of Uganda. So I'm acting in accordance with the law to go and tell people about my aspiration and get, hopefully, support. Now, you know, to stop me is obviously to act in breach of the law and clear it's undemocratic. But they say that uh, your declaration so far, in fact, is illegal, that you have actually jumped the electoral queue uh, that is not yet time. Let me come back to that. Uh, thanks, Mariama, for bringing us this week's audience reaction. Well, thanks to you, Shaka, and thanks to our guests for weighing in. That will do it for today's social media segment. Just a reminder that we appreciate all the feedback, whether it's in social media form or using other means to communicate to us. Please keep them coming. And if you are a new fan, just drop us a line at africatv at voanews.com. Once again, our email address is africatv at voanews.com or post your comment on our Facebook page. Just enter the keywords Straight Talk Africa. Be sure to visit us online at voaafrica.com or you can join our YouTube channel. Sign up to VOA TV to Africa and don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Now, let's take a look at what's on tap for next week's program. In the past 20 years, 18 African nations have been ravaged by war. Tens of thousands of people have been victims of violence or witnessed horrific acts of terror and now suffer from the post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. We'll take a closer look at the effects of PTSD for survivors of conflict and war. Join us next week right here on Straight Talk Africa. Welcome back. Uh, today we are talking about term limits and the politics of succession in Africa. Our distinguished guests are Amama Mbabazi, former Ugandan Prime Minister, who recently declared his intention to seek the Ugandan presidency under the ruling National Resistance Movement, or NRM, and Ambassador Harmon Joe Cohen, former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs. He recently authored a book entitled the Mind of the African Strongman, Conversations with Dictators, Statesmen, and Father Figures. Well, gentlemen, once again, I have to say I'm, pro I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host you on Straight Talk Africa. You're welcome. Yeah, You're most welcome, gentlemen. I gather that I have to go to the lifeline of the show, which are the telephone callers. Good afternoon, uh, Morrison from Cambridge, Massachusetts. I'm fine, Shaka. How are you? I am hugely terrific. Uh, what is your question? You have one minute, Morrison. No, the one minute question I have is that uh, Honorable Amama Mbawazi has been the operational chief operating at the tactical level uh, with the operations of government as a former prime minister. Actually, the running with the terms of reference, which, are, which were aimed at you know, defining efficiency of government, so why is it that uh, now he has announced and his claim is that uh, he wants to uh, deepen when he's outside what he didn't do uh, when he was there? Because as I know, the president deals with the strategic issues and the prime minister handles the tactical issues of operational, making sure that policies uh, that are that are 
codified are actually implemented. And when I listened to his eight points that he articulated when he was announcing his presidential bid, they are clearly act in the National Development Plan and the Vision 2040 in Uganda, which was clearly part of. So it leaves us to wonder what clearly are motivations for his challenge, although I appreciate that it is his constitutional right and he's welcome to be at a standing national resistance movement. Thank you very much, uh, Morrison. Well, you hear and I have read it elsewhere that, in fact, contrary to what you might think, you are not God's gift to democracy. You are not God's gift to Uganda. That you've been around, that the back, in fact, for the most part, some people think, stopped at your desk. Well, we'll have to go for a break, think about it, and then you react. A reminder that you are tuned in to Straight Talk Africa. To participate in our discussions, please call us at 202-619-3111. The US country code is one. We'll continue our discussion in a moment, so please, don't go away. Once again, let's take a look at presidential term limits in some parts of Africa. In October 2014, Burkina Faso's President Blaise Compaore was forced to resign and flee to neighboring Ivory Coast after tens of thousands of citizens demonstrated in the streets over a controversial parliamentary vote that would have extended his 27-year reign. In March 2013, in Zimbabwe, a new constitution was passed in a referendum vote, setting a maximum of two five-year terms for the president, starting with the next election. However, it's not retroactive, so President Robert Mugabe, if elected, could rule for another two terms. And finally, in 2012, voters ousted Senegalese President Abdoulaye Wad as he sought a third term. He had changed the constitution during his first term, which he then argued didn't count against the new two-term limit. After months of sporadic protest, President Wad was voted out. We are able to touch on things that are important to people on an everyday basis. We hope that our viewers are getting inspired when they watch our show. They're getting a view of the world from a different perspective, things that perhaps are not in their immediate vicinity. Today, I could put in on the show something that is a little different, a little unique, and this gives me that uh, you know, inspiration to come to work. If you like today's show, please write and tell us what you think or give us some suggestions. Be sure to tell us what station you're tuned into. Our address, Straight Talk Africa, Voice of America, 330 Independence Avenue, Southwest, Washington, D.C., 20237, USA. Or send us an email at africatv at voanews.com. Log on to our website at voaafrica.com or post your comments on Facebook. Keywords, Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Esther Gizu Iwat. And of course, this is Straight Talk Africa, coming to you live from Washington. Let me go to Benjamin from Uganda, Benjamin Alipanga. Good evening, Benjamin. You're most welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Good evening, Shaka. Thank I am you huge, very much. For... I am hugely terrific. How are you? I'm fine. What is your question? You have a minute, Benjamin. Uh, I actually do not have a question, but I have a comment. Go for it. Yes, uh, when we talk of uh, African leaders uh, being so much interested in uh, third term and extending their uh, uh, periods of rule in, uh, in Africa and Uganda also, uh, I think one thing comes to mind that when they stay so long in power, they build a kind of a group around them. And sometimes it is this kind of grouping that is responsible for their stay because they somehow acquire status and the property and all those kind of things. And this is what they want to protect by keeping those leaders in power. And they start giving all sorts of excuses for themselves to remain in power very, very much reminiscent of uh, the animal farm story. And I think uh, we are going to see this kind of phenomenon for long in Africa. 
Uh, well, because, you're talking about uh, George Orwell's Animal Farm. Why don't their people yes, yes, vote yes. them out? Is it perhaps because they have no vote? Uh, not, not because of that, but I think uh, they just want to remain there, and so they keep on changing the goalposts, changing the laws uh, to maintain themselves in power. I see, yeah. I see. Can you respond to Morrison's questions, please, Mr. Prime Minister? Well, um, if it is the Morrison I know, Mr. Walker Kamb, I think, mm -hmm. um, I, I understand from what angle he's speaking. Um, Why? Because uh, he's uh, an, an employee and a supporter of the president. So he's your colleague, in effect, because you belong to the same ruling party. <laughs> well, you know, uh, there is a difference between an employee and belonging to a party. I see. Th th these are two different things. But what about some who say that uh, in Uganda, really, there is absolutely no difference between the ruling party and the state, that the two are fused? Well, and no, you've been no, with that government no, for 29 years, so surely you must know something no, about no, that. No, no, not quite. It's a question of abuse. Only when it occurs that the state machinery is used to favor party. Mm -hmm. But it's not that they are fused because the laws are clear. And, uh, but the implementation the or lack so of it? Yes, the, these, these are very clear. But le let me tell Mr. Uh, uh, Worker camp, I think it is, that um, I have, I said also in my statement, which you referred to, that in the coming days and weeks, I'll be coming out with my policies on these issues. And obviously, I, I will not do so today because I don't have time for it. And maybe it's not the appropriate place to be. But generally speaking, as clearly I stated in my declaration, my thrust is uh, about better governance. I have been in it. You know, what, what is the saying? The English saying, the old boom. Mm. I have been in it. I know where the problems are. Mm. I know where the weaknesses are. Mm. I know why I was not able to do certain things. I will talk about them when I come. But the you don't want to talk about of, it today? I, I don't have time. It's, okay. a, it's a major okay. issue. Okay. But it's a question of uh, better governance. It is a question of improving our economic uh, performance. Generally, it's a question of uh, improved quality of life. These are the things that I'm looking at, and I'm going to be specific in each one of them to the greatest detail possible of course, people... about where we are as a country, where we have bottlenecks, mm. and what we need to do to overcome them. I see. Yes. Now, how many about the book? You talk about a lot of uh, leaders here, but there is one you skip, and that is, I think, Mary Sezenawi, the latest Mary Sezenawi, because the last time I checked, you negotiated a deal that uh, made uh, uh, Mengistu Hare Maria, president of Ethiopia, head for the nearest Zimbabwean political tall grass, and Mary came to Addis Ababa as the man in charge. Yes, uh, well, I try to avoid uh, people who were still in the public light. I tried to write mainly about those who have left the scene. Mm -hmm. And when I was writing this, Mellis was still in power. I didn't anticipate his premature death. But uh, I thought that he was great as a guerrilla leader, fighting for freedom, for democracy, for allowing Eritrea to have a referendum where they could have self-determination. Mm -hmm. I thought that was wonderful. But when he became the leader of the country, I think he lapsed into ethnicity. In other words, his group of Tigray, Tigray which is 11% of the population, mm. has totally monopolized power. And that includes economic power as well as political power. So he really disappointed me a great deal, although he was a man with a terrific mind, a very intelligent gentleman, but he was succumbed to ethnic uh, identity. Eth ethnic chauvinism. What about some leaders you talked to and you come out saying, you know what, these specific individuals, frankly, did not seem to have respect for their own people. 
they were so condescending, so contemptuous of their people's intelligence, their people's ability to help develop their own nation. Well, I, I, my first assignment as a diplomat was in Uganda. And I was there six months as a young diplomat, and I suddenly said, doesn't anybody care about the rural people, people who are the majority in this yeah, country? Everything yeah. is happening in the cities, and nothing is going out to help them. And at that point, I said, while our high priority, the Americans, was economic development, the leaders didn't seem to have that priority. They had other things to, to worry about. But I was impressed with President Museveni when he came in, in his younger days. Mm. He really wanted to look at economic development. And Are you he still wanted, impressed? He was against African socialism. He was for private sector. He Are really, you still impressed, Tommy? Well, I think it's time for him to go to his farm I see. and give power to someone else. And take care of the cows. <laughs> I see. What about you, uh, Mr. Babazi? Uh, it is on record that you were the champion or perhaps the salesman of the Public Order Management Act, which seems, to be in, which seems to be haunting you now, because some of the email, some of the uh, letters that we're looking at uh, from the Inspector General of the Police, is General Kari Kahira Inspector General of the Ugandan Police, or is he in fact the Inspector General of the Yoweri Museveni Police? Well, let me clarify this. And you have a minute, I, my brother. I, I think there has been a misunderstanding. The Public Order Management Act was an act that was necessitated by the decision of the Constitutional Court, which struck out a provision in the Police Act that gave police power mm. to permit assemblies, demonstrations, or not permit these. I see. The court ruled these were unconstitutional. It also ruled, however, that it was important to have a law which would regulate the management of uh, those freedoms being exercised by our people. So the Public Order Management Act actually mm -hmm. does not give police any power to stop or do anything of the kind. I, I see the Inspector General of Police is writing to me saying that I am not cleared. He has no authority to clear me or not clear me. I see. It doesn't exist. So the problem is not the law. The problem is the consistent breaching of that law by the police. We are running out of time. What makes you think that you are really the best man for the job in Uganda? Given some of the accusations about corruption and what have you, mismanagement of government, mismanagement of responsibility. What makes you think that they are the man? You are well, completely different. Let me begin with the corruption. You know, yes, there have been corruptions, uh, allegations. You but have of, 30 seconds. Okay, all these were cleared by all manner of investigations. They were false. Secondly, what I'm proposing is that it is time for change. And I'm offering myself to lead that process of change the transition from the old generation to the new. And I don't think there is anyone better suited to do that than I have been uh, in light of my experience. Unfortunately, time happens not to be our best ally on that note. Thanks to our distinguished guests, Amama Mbabazi, former Ugandan Prime Minister, who recently declared his intention to seek the Ugandan presidency under the ruling National Resistance Movement, or NRM. And Ambassador Harmony J. Cohen, former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs. Thanks to our affiliate stations, along with our viewers and listeners, we thank you for tuning in. For many of our Voice of America radio affiliates, learning English is coming up next. And tomorrow morning, it's Daybreak Africa with James Bate. On behalf of the Voice of America, thanks for tuning in to Straight Talk Africa. In the meantime, get better, not better, Africa. And please remember to keep the African hopes alive.